God's good, isn't he? All the time. That's right. We say it all the time. And you know, the problem with that one little thing where we say God is good and and we do this little back and forth is that it's, it runs the risk of it becoming cliche to us because we say it so often that we don't even think about what we're saying, but it is the truth. God is good all the time, all the time, even when things are not going good in my life. Can I get an amen? Anybody ever have those moments? Somebody, anybody, you're like moments. Anybody have that year? (laughs) You know what I'm talking about. But even though bad things are happening around me, it does not change the fact my God is good. Amen. Amen. Well, today we are actually, that's a very good segue because today we're continuing our series on living abundantly. And we've been talking about the characteristics of that abundant life. And we've been talking about the fruit of the spirit. And today we're going to be talking about the fruit of goodness. How appropriate is that we're ta- is it that we're talking about how good God is when we're talking about the fruit of the spirit of goodness? So turn to the book of Colossians in the New Testament. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. This is what it says. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of, of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened in all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of the kingdom of God. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way that you have prepared our hearts today uh, to receive the the ministry of the word. Thank you for the moving of your spirit in our worship and prayer time. Thank you for filling this place with your awesome holy power. Thank you for your word, O God. And and now, Lord, I pray that you would would bear your word deep into our innermost being. God, that that I, I pray that you would just Sweep aside every hindrance that that stands in the way so that we can hear clearly from you. And Lord, I'm not asking you to make me clever or witty or anything like that. I'm just asking God that you would anoint your word to go forth in power. I'm asking God that when we leave this place, every one of us will say, surely I have heard from God today. I'm believing you for that in advance. And I thank you for it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Somebody say praise the Lord. Lord. In the Broadway musical entitled Camelot, there is a uh, point in the play where the kingdom of of Arthur has settled into a peaceful time. The wars are over and there's this outward appearance that everything is going to be just great in all of Camelot. Arthur thinks that everything is perfect in Camelot and, and he tries to enforce the goodness of Camelot. This, and he passes laws. The, the snow is never allowed to slush along the roadside. It must only rain in the dark and never rain in the daylight. It, 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 it will never be a bad day in Camelot. But deep underneath, there is a simmering rebellion. Guinevere, his wife, plays out her affair with Lancelot and the knights all simmer with rebellion at this imposed goodness of King Arthur. And at one point, they sing a song in the musical comedy version called Fie on Goodness. And they say, oh, this is what they say in the song, oh, but to slay a dozen men or burn a little town, anything to laugh again. And I suppose, you know, that's meant to be very charming and witty and humorous. But of course, the problem in Camelot is this. Goodness is not the dry, brittle imposition of law, which takes the joy and the laughter out of life. The fact is, I've never heard of a life being ruined. In fact, you will never hear of a life or a family being ruined by too much goodness. Now, it, it can be ruined by false goodness. It can be ruined by legalism. It can be ruined by the imposition of law, but it will never be ruined by the goodness of God. And and as we consider this wonderful, <clears throat> excuse me, fruit of the Spirit, the, the next in our series on the abundant life that God has promised for all who follow Him, we, we, wanna, we need to begin by looking at what real goodness is. What is 
goodness. Well, the first thing we need to understand is that goodness is not just doing good things. It's not just doing good things. It, <clears throat> it must have about it something that relates to the essence of character. The, the quality of goodness has to do with something done simply because it is good, not because it looks good, not because it will gain you points, not because it gets you brownie points, not because anybody else looks at it and says, wow, that's a nice person there, but simply because it is good. It's an inner quality that, that causes an outward reality. Goodness is a state of being from which good action emanates. You know, there, there's a chapel in Galilee <clears throat> that is absolutely beautiful to see. Uh, it has a, a garden court yard surrounding it. And, and I don't know if it's true, but it is said that the chapel was paid for by Benito Mussolini. Anybody remember who Benito Mussolini is from your history lessons? He was the dictator, the fascist dictator of Italy during World War II. He was a man who caused immense pain and, and immense suffering uh, in many people's lives. And, and on the surface, one might say that to build such a beautiful chapel in such a beautiful place by the Sea of Galilee, surely that's a good thing to do. However, it did not emanate from a heart of goodness, if in fact it was built by, by Mussolini. Well, what about, think about this, what about rock stars that put on benefit concerts for every kind of cause in the world, but uh, their lives are racked with pain and the, and the bondage of alcoholism and drug addiction and sexual immorality. Can we say in, in, in any real sense of the word that they are good? What, what about a murderous mobster who pays for the surgery of a crippled child? Is, is he a good man because he does an isolated good deed? Well, no, not in any biblical sense of the word. In the biblical sense of the word, simply doing good things cannot, can never, ever make me good. It cannot induce and, or introduce the fruit of, the, of goodness into my life. I cannot, now listen to this, I, I cannot, by all the good that I do, ever change my innermost self. I cannot do good things and change anything inside of my own heart. One cannot make oneself good by acting good. But if there is goodness in my innermost being, then sooner or later, that will leak to the extremities of my actions. So if the goodness is on the inside, I will eventually do good things. However, if I do good things, it does not make me a good person inside. Does that make sense? So how does this goodness relate to God's character? Well, first of all, both Ezra and Nehemiah speak of the good hand of God resting upon them. And then David in Psalm 34, 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. And the, the psalmist there gives a picture of the delightfulness of the goodness of God. You know, I, and, and sometimes I think that we as modern Christians, we have this view in our mind. We have this picture in our mind of the holiness of God. And we think of it as some great sterile cloud bank that's just floating through the Milky Way. And, and, and it is so pure in, in its essential righteousness that anything that even approaches it will just immediately be melted. But, but they see, you know, sometimes we see no warmth. We see no delight in the holiness of God and the goodness of God. They, they hear no laughter coming from inside the cloud, but that's not the goodness of God that I've come to know. The goodness of God that I've come to know is a gurgling brook deep in the forest of heaven. It's a, it's a mountain that echoes with the booming laughter of a father God who has made me and redeemed me and bought me with great price out of whose goodness I find oceans and oceans of boundless love. The goodness of God. Here's, the, here's what I want you to understand. The goodness of God is the thing that in, in essence separates me from God. You say, what do you mean? Let me put it in another way. This is actually more clear. It's my sin or my lack of goodness that separates me from God. Because he is good and I am not in my essence. I am separated from God. But in, in the midst of that, in, in, in that circumstance, in that situation, 
It is the goodness of God that extends toward me in my sin, that it's calling me in, that is wooing me closer, that is drawing me, as the, as the book of Jeremiah says, with bands of love. You see, the goodness of God is warm, not cold. It's supple, not brittle. It's unchanging, unchangeable vitality. And in Matthew 7, 11, Jesus said, if you then, though you are evil, how many of you hear evil? Let me see your hand. Yeah, well, whether you know it or not, you are. If you've, if you've committed a sin, then, then you're, you're evil, okay? So maybe does it, I know I'm not talking about you're not like an evil genius trying to take over the world or anything like that. You're like pinky in the brain or something. That's, I'm dating myself there, aren't I? But, uh, but I'm saying that when, if we have sinned, if we have sinned, then we are sinners and thereby, by definition, we're evil. And he says, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? If, you, if, you're, if a good father on this earth gives you gifts, they will be good gifts, right? And if a good father in heaven gives you gifts, they will be good gifts. And in fact, James wrote that every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of lights who does not change like shifting shadows. In Luke's version of what Matthew reported in chapter 11, uh, Luke eleven thirteen, he says, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He defines the good gift that he gives to us a little more clearly. Clearly, the, the Holy Spirit meaning is the spirit of God's goodness. You know, if God breathes, he breathes the breath of his own character and nature. God is a good God. Therefore, his spirit is the spirit of his own goodness. In Romans 12, 2, it speaks of the goodwill of God. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. You know, I've, I've found that sometimes we as Christians, we, there's so many times we just have a hard time believing that God's will for us is good. You know, there, there's some modern Christians that believe that the will of God is a lot like medicine. You know what that means? That means that unless it tastes bad, it doesn't do you any good. You know, it seems like the medicine that does me the most is the taste the worst. But listen, the, that's not like the will of God. The will of God, uh, uh, the will of a good God for me must, because he is a good God, it must be a good will. The, the, the goodness of God willed into my life is reflective of his own character and nature. How can a good God ever will bad things for me? Now that doesn't mean that he's not going to allow bad things to happen. It doesn't mean that he's not going to let me walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But it was what it does mean is that when I do walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to fear anything because my good shepherd is with me. The prophet Jeremiah said, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And I know that's written to Israel in a very specific circumstance, but it still speaks of the goodness of God toward those who love him, toward those who return to him, toward those who walk in repentance, toward those who come and, and, and are his children. It speaks of the goodness of God and the, and the fact that he plans good for us and he wants to give us a future and a hope. God wants the best for our lives. Why is that? It's because God is good. All the time, God is good. That's why he wants the best for our lives. Now, understand this. That does not mean he gives me everything I want. Right? Any parent here, give your child everything they want. I hope you're saying no. I hope every parent is saying no, because if you do, you're raising a a terror for the world uh, that's coming later on, probably already a terror in your household. No, no. If you're a good parent, there are many things that you say no to your children about, right? Because there are things that you look at them and say, no, you can't have that. That's not good for you. If your child came to you and said, mom, I really want to taste it. So can I have a cup of bleach to drink? I want a cup of bleach to drink. If you're a good parent, you're going to say, no, not a chance, not ever. 
Get that thought out of your mind. You, you're, 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 that will destroy you. That's really bad for you. There's no way you can have that. But if you're a bad parent, you're going to say, sure, why not? Let's see what will happen. Right? So all that to say that, that God wants the best for our life. But the, but the caveat in that is God also knows what's best for my life. Even when I don't. Even when I don't. L look at the goodness of God. Look at the very essence of creation. God separated the gr dry ground from the waters, and it says that it, He says that it, that it was good. He created the plants, and God saw that it was good. And God created the sun, the moon, and the stars, and He saw that it was good. He created all of the creatures that live in the water, and all of those that live on dry land, and He saw that it was good. And at the end of it all, it, God saw it all, everything that He had created, and He saw that it was all very good good. Why was it good? It was good because it was spoken into existence out of the creative resources of a God who is fundamentally good. God is good. Therefore, all that he created was good. And in, then in John 10, 11, Jesus himself is, is called the good shepherd. So we see that goodness is is in the very character and nature of God. And, and you must understand the definition of the fruit of the Spirit of goodness as a fruit that springs from the reality of the vine. Grapes have about them the character of a grapevine. They have the essence. I'm going to give you an, a new word. I'm going to invent a new word for today. They have the essence of grapeness. All right? Because they spring from a grapevine. When you pluck an apple from an apple tree, you get appleness. When you, when you get a peach from a peach tree, you get peachness. Listen, when you get goodness from a Christian, it's because he's been grafted into the vine of the goodness of God. And out of the goodness of God, we bear that goodness as a fruit in our lives. The very character and nature of God is that he is good. Therefore, because of that, it is... It is the character and nature of the spirit-filled Christian who is abiding in the vine. If, if the life of God is good, then he wants to pour goodness out, not only to my life, but into my life and through my life. Now, one of the things we're doing in this series, every week we look at counterfeits in the flesh for each of the fruits. So what is the counterfeit of the, of the fruit of goodness in our lives? Well, there are two kinds, and one of them is very, the first one's very obvious, and that is self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is a counterfeit, counterfeit for goodness. Works-oriented goodness, which is self-righteousness, because you're saying I'm good because of what I do, that, that it is a counterfeit for the true goodness that comes from the Spirit of God. Self-righteousness, what does that mean? It means to dress my, my life all up in, in all of the re religious garments and, and to prove myself in terms of vocabulary, culture, and language that, uh, of whatever tradition it is that I'm in and to prove that I'm good. So I'm keeping the rules of whatever tradition it is. So if you're, you know, if you're, if you're like me, I grew up in a Pentecostal home and, uh, and, in, in, and I grew up in a Pentecostal home back in the 60s and 70s. Some of you are some of you are like, you, you were, a lot of you, I'm looking around and you, you have no memory of the 60s because I know you weren't alive in the 60s. And some of you barely remember the 70s. Some of you barely remember the 70s, but it's not because of your age. But anyway, we'll go there. Uh, that's a whole different issue there. But growing up in a Pentecostal home in the 60s and 70s, we didn't go to movie theaters. In fact, listen, if you were in a movie theater in Jesus Return, you weren't going. That was the, that was the way it was set up, you know. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't go to dances. That's why, listen, if, 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 I have nothing against dancing, but you're just not going to see that because I busted my move. Uh, it's just, I, I, don't, I don't know how to dance. I never did because that's what we didn't do. We, there were a lot of things we didn't do. You know, a lot, of them, a lot of churches back then, they didn't go into bowling alleys. Our church did because we had a bowling league, so I guess that turned to, turned it into okay, you know, so that sort of thing. But but we we didn't do a lot of things that the Bible never really actually talked about. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've been down that road. But the the rule was basically, I don't cuss, smoke, drink, or chew, and I won't run around with girls that do. 
That was the, the kind of the rule for a life back then. And self-righteousness is when we obey all of the nice, tidy rules in our life, in our tradition, or whatever it is, so that we can say that we are good and we look good to everybody else. Of course, the fact of the matter is, you might never go into a movie theater. You might never drink liquor. You might never have a beer. You might never smoke a cigarette. You might even be pretty good and, and never really, never even tell a lie. You, you might never commit sexual immorality. You might never do drugs. But you know what? In your heart, you can still be filled with every wicked demon of lust and fear and hate and bitterness and envy and strife known to man. Some of the most miserable, neurotic, angry, mean people I have ever known have been some of the most legalistic Pentecostals in the world. I heard a mm hmm in there. Uh, listen, I just want to say this. The, the face of holiness as a Christian is not weaned on a pickle. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm saying? You're not more holy because you look sour. That's all. That's another way of saying it. Holiness is not that miserable, legalistic, iron-bound, brittle legalism that's filled with every kind of anger and bitterness and resentment in the world. So self-righteousness is a counterfeit to the goodness of God. But there's another kind of counterfeit goodness, and self-righteousness is easy to see, and that usually plays out in a church setting, but there's one that's even more common, and it is the counterfeit goodness of the world. Are you ready for this? And you'll see this, you see this a lot. The further south you go, the deeper south you are, the more you're going to see this when niceness is a worldly counterfeit for goodness. Niceness. And we are good at being nice in the south, right? I mean, even, even when you insult somebody, you do it by saying, bless their heart, right? <laughs> You know, everybody said it with me. We all know what I'm talking about here. Uh, the, the world says, you know, hey, we're not into all this legalism stuff. We're not into that. So we're just going to throw all that off. And we're going we're gonna to walk in and move into a new liberty. And they say, how do we define goodness? And the world defines goodness as that nice, friendly, deadly rebellion that is pleasant and kindly, but is filled with evil on the inside. We can be the worst person in the world the greatest sinner in the world, and still be nice. See, I, I read a fascinating quote recently from the mother of Jesse, Frank and Jesse James. Everybody knows who Frank and Jesse James were, right? The notorious outlaws, killers, thieves. By the way, I don't know if you know it, they were sons of a Baptist preacher. So uh, that says something. But this is what her, their mother said of them. And I said, uh, somebody, I'm not sure what somebody just said, but I'm not even going to ask because I'm afraid I'm going to offend a Baptist somewhere. But, but here, this is what she said. She, listen to this quote. She said, Jesse and Frank are good boys. They just like to play with guns. <laughs> well, listen, that's a fine statement if you're talking about Lee. Because he's a good boy, but he likes to play. He likes to shoot things. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. But, but I mean, listen to that quote again. Jesse and Frank are good boys. Good boys? Murdering thieves. They're good boys. They just like to play with guns. See, she was happy to accept the outer goodness while ignoring the evil inside. Well, they were good to their mother. You know, they, they bought her presents on her birthday every year. Of course, they were able to buy them because they stole the money, but they were good to their mothers. So she said that they were good boys because there was a kind of goodness that affected her life. They were good to her, and she ignored the fact that they were evil on the inside. And we see this all the time. You know, young ladies will come to their parents and they say, oh, he's a good boy. He's a good boy. Parents... And anybody in the educational system will, will hear this one. Parents will say of the children, but they're, they're nice children. They're good kids. And, and, and people will speak of the husbands or wives in the most glowing terms. Oh, they're a good person, even though they know that they're lost and undone, perhaps even in deep spiritual, spiritual bondage one, or not, one way or another, but they're nice to me. And since they're nice to me, I say they're good. 
And I, I just wonder, have we lost our sense of discernment? Have we gotten so confused that we can't tell the difference between a good preacher and a good man? The world's counterfeit for goodness is no better than the church's counterfeit. And there must be a deep inner reality. It has to go far beyond just being nice and polite. It's about the quality of what's inside of our hearts. So how can we detect, detect a lack of goodness in our lives? Well, it seems obvious. Well, if I don't have goodness, I'll do bad stuff. But, th but that kind of denies the definition because good things don't make us good people. And so bad things, you know, I mean, here's, here's what I'm trying to say. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.3 3 says that there, that there will come a time when, the, when there will be people who despise those who are good. I, I, we're seeing much of that in our culture today. Seeing a lot of that. But one of the, one of the great signs of a breakdown in basic goodness in, in a culture, in a society, is when you find the mockery of that which is good. And I'm going to say this in all love and in all gentleness. This is very important, I, though. Americans have come to the place, and too often we as Christians have come to the place where anything that is funny is justified by the weight of its own humor. Well, I know it was evil. I know, I know it was dirty. I know it was irreverent. I know it was wicked. I know it was racially oriented. I know it hurt people. I know it wounded the heart of God, but it was so funny. It was just so funny. And I don't mean to, to, that we should walk about, you know, like a sober, smug, self-righteous, uh, religious nut. That's, that's exact, exactly the opposite of what I'm talking about. But, but, but I am saying that there must come a point at which spirit-filled Christians, grafted into the vine and growing in the abundant life of goodness, we say to ourselves, we say, no, that's not funny. No, I'm not, I'm not going to buy into that. It's just not funny. Jokes that wound people at the point of their racial identification are not funny. It's not funny to God. It's just not funny, and I believe God hates it. Jokes that hurt people because of their weight or their size or their shape or anything else, they're just not funny. The, even, though the, even though the fat boy may be the first one to laugh and the one to laugh the loudest, it's just, it's just not funny to God. There, there's some things that are just not funny. Uh, sexual jokes uh, about, you know, listen, we forget, and I know this gets us uncomfortable, we forget that sex is a holy thing that God came up with for, the, for marriage, and it's an intimacy that He has, and yet, yet the world makes it just into, into just this, this body humor that is gross. And so often, people just sit and laugh at this, but they're, they're just some things that are not funny to God. I, I really feel like we can, say, we can really determine a lot of where we are and where we need to grow. I'm not saying that we're not Christian or anything like that, but we can determine where we need to grow by looking at our lives and saying, what is it that I'm willing to laugh at? And I'm not saying that when somebody else laughs at it, you jump down their throat and say, oh, I can't believe it. You know, that's what I'm saying. But I'm saying, what are you willing to laugh at? You know, some years ago, one of the comedians from Saturday Night Live was asked why the show has endured. And, and his answer was this. He said, it's because absolutely nothing has been sacred. He said, the secret of our success on Saturday Night Live is that nothing is sacred. And my friend, I've got to tell you, that makes my skin crawl. If nothing is sacred, if everything, everyone, even God himself is subject to mockery and derision, then we've come to the place where we not only are not good ourselves, but we despise those who are good. We hate the goodness of another. Uh, and so mockery is an obvious and manifest symbol of the lack of basic fundamental goodness. We see it in our culture widely. Second, the inability to be genuine in compassion and sacrificial in help is a mark of a lack of goodness. Jesus tried to teach this in Luke chapter 10 when he told the story of the Good Samaritan. He said there was a man on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho 
And he fell among thieves who beat him and stripped him and stole everything he had. And they tossed him beside the road and left him to die. And we know the story. First of all, two men came, came along, one at, right after the other, who ought to have been identified as good. One was a priest and the other one was a Levite, which meant he worked at the, so he's like the pastor and the guy who works at the church. They come by and, and they just wouldn't have anything to do with him. They had all, all the signs and the trappings of goodness, the outward appearance of goodness, but neither one of them had any genuine compassion for this man's pain, nor were they willing to take sacrificial action for his good. And the main reason why they didn't was because they didn't want to, they didn't want to risk their religious activities because if he was dead and they touched him, then they'd be disqualified from doing their work. Who stopped though? Anybody remember? Right. The, the one who appeared to have the least goodness, a Samaritan. Now, you don't understand that. You don't understand that the Samaritan was a, was a person, Jesus choosing a Samaritan. He was choosing in their culture someone who they would expect to have the least amount of goodness. But Samaritans, hey, they didn't even worship at the temple. They worship at a false temple on Mount Gerizim. The, the Samaritans were confused theologically. They were confused spiritually. Jesus could not have chosen anybody less likely to be the hero of the story in the minds of those who were listening. The Samaritans were considered a polluted race. They were considered to be blasphemous, having nothing to do with the temple in Jerusalem. And so, so Jesus could not have chosen a less likely hero let alone, not just to be the hero of the story, but he could not have chose anyone less likely to portray the very essence of goodness. In fact, you, you said it a moment ago, he is still called to this day the good Samaritan. The good Samaritan. A basic lack of goodness is revealed by a lack of genuine compassion and a lack of a willingness to be sacrificial in giving help. So what's the damage done by a lack of goodness? One of the greatest, most terrifying damages done is that a lack of goodness introduces disillusionment and bitterness into the lives of others. You know, the world is full of disillusioned, bitter people who at one time or another looked to Christians. They looked to those who attend church they look to, uh, to, uh, to those that are in ministry or in the pulpit or on television, and they look to them for some example of goodness and yet found hypocrisy and sin and manipulation and evil instead. A basic lack of goodness will bring reproach on the cause of Christ and introduce bitterness into the lives of other people. This is, listen, this is one of the things that is so important to me. It's why I, I covet your prayers constantly for my life because I... As a, as a leader, even though, you know, we're not a massive mega church or anything, but I still, I never want to do anything that would embarrass the kingdom of God or would embarrass the king himself. I, I know that because I'm a pastor, people are watching my life. I know that because I'm a husband, my wife is watching my life. I know that because I'm a daddy, my daughters are watching my life. And you know what that forces me to, to what, what forces me to my knees more than anything else in, in search of the inner reality of goodness, it is that the man you see here in this pulpit has got to be the same man that sits down and eats dinner with his wife and his children. I'm absolutely terrified at the thought that my children would, be, would ever be sitting in the congregation saying, oh yeah, well, you ought to see him at the house. I must, I want to be the same person no matter wherever I am. Or, or, or that my wife would be sitting there and, and, in her, and during a message in her heart of hearts saying, oh yeah, he talks about goodness, but you, you ought to know the man that he really is. God forbid. I, that's why I covet your prayers. I don't want to ever do anything to, to cast a shadow on the kingdom of God or on my Savior. I, I, I believe that we have to take seriously the damage that is done in the lives of others by a lack of goodness. Here's another thing. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but this is especially for parents and especially for dads. A lack of goodness generates rebellion. It generates rebellion. Ephesians 6, 4 says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. Now, 
Kids like to quote that, but let me just say this. Uh, that, 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 that does not mean that you should not make your children angry. That's not what the verse says. You know, every time you spank them, every time you discipline them, every time you deprive them of something they want, every time you put them on restriction or if they're much younger, uh, time out or whatever it is, every time you scold them, every time you correct them, that may make them angry with you. It's okay that your children get angry with you when they don't get their way. That's not what he's talking about. It, what it says is, fathers, do not drive your children to the unreasonable wrath of a false role model where they see you that you act one way at church and another way at home and there's lack of goodness at home and you're not real at home and then they begin to say this whole religious thing, this whole Jesus thing, it's all fake and they begin to rebel against you and everything that you stand for. That's, that's what it means. But here, the worst, the most horrible damage done by lack of goodness is that it performs a character assassination on Jesus. Listen, I'm going to say something that should be very sobering for us. The world around you is making up its mind about Jesus. Not by what they hear me say, uh, behind this pulpit or on a live stream. The world is making up its mind about Jesus by watching you at work, by looking at you in your high school, by watching how you treat your employers, by employees, by and how you treat your employers, uh, by, by the way you pay your workers, by the way you act publicly. The world is making up its mind about Jesus by watching you and me and watching excuse me, watching how we treat other people. Oh, don't assassinate the character of Jesus. Don't libel this man who went about healing, who, who went about delivering, who went about setting people free, who went about loving the lost, who was a friend of sinners. Don't assassinate the character of Jesus by a lack of goodness in our lives. So what are the results of goodness in our lives? If we were to abound with this fruit of goodness, what would it mean in our lives? Well, first thing is, goodness helps me find usefulness. That's such a quaint old word that, I mean, but did you just, uh, especially young people, listen to me for just a minute. I have a word for you. because, And when I say young people, everybody under 40 looks young to me. <laughs> You know, the older I get, the younger everybody else is. You ever have that moment where you're getting older and then you see a friend from high school you haven't seen for years and you look at them and you say, you walk away saying, man, they look old. And you realize they're walking away saying, man, they look old because you look the same. You know what I'm talking about. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. But listen to this, especially those of you who are younger. You need to be aware of this. You are living in a society in modern America that has baptized itself in selfishness. Our culture is baptized in selfishness. It's all about me. It's what I want. I want it now. If you don't give me what I want, I mean, if you don't believe it, just go stand uh, some, at any fast food restaurant. But, I, but I've heard stories at Chick-fil-A. Just go stand at Chick-fil-A and watch how people react when the order is not fulfilled correctly. I mean, you think that they had denied the virgin birth of Christ or something. You know, I mean, people are up. It's like, you did this on purpose. Where are my pickles? You know, it's like, no, we, we really wanted to get it right. We just mess up sometimes. But, but, but listen, I'm just, I'm just saying we, and why, why do we act like that? It's because we think we deserve better. And we're self-centered. This is the culture we live in. I'm not talking about all of us individually, but we are in the midst of a generation that is saturated with self-interest. But, Here's what we need to know. The kingdom of God, following Jesus, living for him, is not about self-interest. It is about usefulness in the kingdom. It's not about what it, what's in it for me. Now, there's a lot in it for me. Following Jesus, there's a lot of benefits to that. But ultimately, my serving Christ and, and, and what I'm doing is not about me. It's about bringing glory to Christ. It's about Him. It's about usefulness. It's about coming to the end of my life 
and feeling that I blessed somebody, that I strengthened somebody, that somebody got saved because of my life, that somebody grew in holiness because of my life, that churches were built, that people were encouraged, that the kingdom of God was built and strengthened and edified and encouraged, that the, that the world was somehow a, a, or another better because I lived here. It's like some of you remember and others have heard of the quote that John Kennedy said when he said, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what what you can do for your country. But let me rephrase that to make it a little more biblical. Ask not what the world can do for you. And, And I would even say this, ask not what the kingdom of God can do for you. Ask what you can do for the kingdom. Ask how you can serve. Not what can I get out of it. Because here's what we got to understand. If I will serve, I'm going to receive far more than I could possibly imagine. There's a joy and a satisfaction and a peace that comes in serving that you cannot find any other way. And when I chase after all the benefits instead of chasing after serving, then I miss out on all of it. I really do. Have you ever heard somebody say some, uh, something like this? And, and they, they usually say it in a mocking way. They say, oh, he's nothing but a do-gooder. You ever heard that phrase or anything like that? You know, uh, oh, he's, he's just a do-gooder. I, I, that's just kind of funny to me. Isn't, isn't it funny that you never hear anybody say, oh, that guy, he's nothing but a do-batter. <laughs> You ever, you ever think about that? I mean, what a do better. All he does is steal and lie, manipulate and seduce girls and ruin families and sully consciences and tell dirty jokes. He thinks he's worse than everybody else. You ever, you ever hear anybody like that? You know, wouldn't, wouldn't it be wonderful if they, if they could carve on your tombstone, here lies a do-gooder. Wouldn't that a great, be a great thing? How did, how did Peter describe Jesus? He said, him who anointed by the hand of God, who went about doing good, doing good. God knows that this poor, pitiful, mangled planet could use a few people who would go about doing good in the name of Jesus Christ. This world is full of people doing bad, and it takes no work at all to be one of those. This world needs followers of Jesus who will build up instead of tear down, who will edify instead of destroy, who will encourage instead of judge, who will love in, instead of ignore. Every time I leave a room, I, 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 and I don't, I, I, I don't know that I ever really completely fulfill this, but every time I leave a room, I want people to say, man, that guy just makes me feel like a million bucks. I want everybody to, that I pass to hear, I believe in you and, and you can do anything that God calls you to do or, or man, you, you just did a great job or you're really growing in the kingdom. I want people to be strengthened by whatever little strength that I have. Listen, I only have a few years left. I know that. I've, I figured that out. I'm, maybe I only have today left. None of us really knows. But whatever time I have left in this life, when I get to the end of it all, I don't want to have the, the, to, to, to be, only be able to clutch the deed of my house and, and to my chest and say, mine, mine, I, right before I die. I want to be able to look back across my life and, and, and feel that I was useful in God's kingdom and I was useful on this earth somehow. I want my life to be characterized by the goodness of God. I want to, I want to reach the end of this life and, and be able to say, say that I have nothing left to give because I gave it all. I want to, when I stand before Jesus, I don't want to, I don't want to look him in the eye and say, well, you know, Lord, there is, there's more that I could do. I, I could have done this. I could have served this area. I could have loved this person. I could have done more. I want to be able to stand there and say, Jesus, I got nothing left to give to you. I have nothing to offer you because I already gave it all. I already gave it all. That's what I want. To walk and live in that kind of goodness. Goodness is a wellspring of usefulness. Here's the second thing. Goodness will make me happy. This is the thing the world cannot understand because it thinks it can only find happiness in being bad, especially young people today. John Wesley said, people are unhappy because they're unholy. 
the secret of happiness in this world is goodness. We, we think that sin, whatever I want, selfishness, getting what I want, we think that'll make us happy. But in fact, that makes us unhappy because of the fact that when I get what I want, I'm not really satisfied. And then I get more unhappy. And so I think, well, then I want this other thing. Then I get that and it doesn't make me happy and it doesn't satisfy me. So I get more and more unhappy because I'm more and more unfulfilled, filling my life with things in this world that just won't do it. Sin limits our lives, it brings us into bondage, and it shuts, up in the, shuts us up in a cage of demonic oppression. But the goodness of God in us, when we have been grafted into the vine and we're bearing the fruit of goodness, brings me into a life of happiness. The third thing, goodness leads people closer to the God who is the source of all true goodness. When people see genuine righteousness in the life of a believer, they want to get closer to the source of that righteousness. They say, there's something there I don't have. I want to learn about it. Jesus said, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and not then give you glory, but they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. When you do a good thing in the name of Jesus, now it's important, don't leave him out of the picture. You know, uh, one of the things I do when, when, when I see somebody saying, well, can I have some money for food? I don't give out money. I hope, I hope you don't either, unless the Lord specifically tells you to do that. But, but when they say, I'm hungry, I'd like to get something to eat, I don't give out cash, but I often will say, listen, I, I don't have cash. I don't carry cash. I, I never have cash on me, but I say, if, if you're hungry, let's go into this, whatever we are, McDonald's or whatever, I'll buy you anything you want off the menu, get whatever you want. And I've done that at times. And then, and then when I've given them the food, I've always been careful to tell them, listen, I want you to know why I did this. I didn't do it because I'm a good guy, because I'm naturally not. I'm naturally selfish. I did this because I'm a follower of Jesus and he loves you. And he wants you to know that he uh, he wants you to know that he loves you, and because he loves you, I love you. So that's what it means to do it in the name of Jesus. You make sure he's the center of it all. But when you when you do a good thing in the name of Jesus, whether you know when you preach, when you teach, when you give a testimony, when you share, when you care for hurting people, when you buy a meal for somebody, when you give a cup of cold water, uh, when you give a sacrificial offering, you shine your light in this dark world. See, that's the thing. We, if I were to ask you who's the light of the world, everybody here would say Jesus. And that's right. That's correct. However, do you know what Jesus also said in addition to that? He said, you are the light of the world. And we're like the moon. That's what we are. You know, of course, the moon does not emit any light on its own, right? Everybody here has had enough science to know that, right? So when you see the light coming from the moon, it's a reflected light. It's light that you can't see the sun, but the moon is at an angle in such a way that the sun is shining on it. And that light, you see the light shining on that moon and it reflects the light down to us. That's what we're like. We're like the satellites. We're like the moon where the light of Jesus is shining so bright. And when we let that light shine, when we let people see his goodness in us, it's like that love of God, the light of God being reflected to this world. And they see that in us and they see in us a reflection of our Somebody comes to you at, when you do that and they, they say, man, I, I'd like to be more like you. I, I'm not very nice, but man, you're just always so kind. I want to be more like you. And when they do, then you look them straight in the eye and say, do you know what the source of my goodness is? Do you know what the source of my encouragement is? Do you know what the source uh, uh, of, the, of my generosity is? Do you know why I give so much? Do you know why I pray so much? Do you know why I serve so much? Do you know why I, I even give my body to be burned if I need to? It's because of the source, the wellspring, the fountain, the vine of goodness into which I'm grafted. Any goodness you see in me, you tell them, is not in myself. It comes from Jesus, who is perfectly good. The Bible says we've all sinned. We've all gone our own way. The Bible says that there is none righteous. No, not one. 
We have no goodness in and of ourselves. But when we are grafted into the vine of God's goodness, we bear the genuine fruit of, of real goodness for the glory of God. The key to allowing God to do all He wants in our lives is explained by Jesus in a simple sentence. Listen to this, Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God, that's the kingship of Christ over your life, and His righteousness, that's the goodness of God in your life. And all these things will be added to you. In other words, God will bring to pass all that He dreams for you. The key to having real goodness is to seek Jesus in His righteousness. Now, you know, as I prayed for this morning, I realized that not everybody wants to be good. Not everybody cares whether they're righteous or not. Not everybody cares whether they hurt people or help people or whether they build people up or destroy people. They, they, not everybody has a dream of leaving people behind that, them that are in better shape than when they came. Some are perfectly content to leave behind broken bodies and ruined marriages and destroyed relationships and sullied consciences. There, there's not a hunger and thirst for righteousness in their heart. There's not a longing for goodness. And only the Spirit can the Holy Spirit can create passion to be good. Listen to what it says in Matthew 5, 6. Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after the goodness of God, for God will satisfy them. But I have another word for you. I want you to hear this. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst to hunger and thirst after the goodness of God. I believe that if you will genuinely say to God in all sincerity, God, right now where I am, I do not hunger and thirst for righteousness. I really don't have that strong desire for you and for your goodness in my life to think good thoughts, to live a good life, to walk in your holiness and goodness. I don't really hunger for those things, but God, I do hunger to hunger for those things. I'm not really thirsty for righteousness, but oh God, I'm thirsty to thirst for righteousness. I want to want that. I want this in my life. And God, I believe, will hear that prayer and will honor that. Now, now, what is the essence of this? We're going to close with this. I'm ready to close. And here it is, the essence of it. There is no way I can make myself good, not by doing all the good in the world. However, God wants to open a wellspring of goodness inside of me. God wants to do a work inside of my heart that will cause goodness to flow out from my life through my actions. Listen, there are men sitting in this place right now who would say, I'm not fundamentally a good man. I don't really love that which is good. I, I don't really long for that which is good. I don't really have a passion for that which is good. And, and there are women sitting here in this place or watching the live stream who say, I don't really have a river of goodness. Sometimes the river is poison. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes I'm able, I'm able to put my nose to the grindstone and be good for a week or two, but I just can't seem to string them together. There are these gaps, these moments of deep inconsistency consistency in my life. And what is the answer to that? Jesus said it. We read it earlier from Luke eleven thirteen. 13. If you then who are evil. Now, I don't have trouble with that right so far. I agree with everything he's saying so far. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children. And listen, for all my lack of goodness, if my child asks for something good, I don't give her something bad. For all my lack of goodness, I still know how to give something good to somebody who asked me. Then he says, how much more will the heavenly father who is perfectly good and absolutely good give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? How much more will he give to me which is, uh, that which is fundamentally good if I ask him? Listen, the reason I fail to receive is often because I don't ask James said, you have not because you ask not. And when you do ask, he said, you ask with the wrong motives. What is it, therefore, for which I must ask God? I must ask God for his spirit. If God is a good God, then the spirit is the spirit of goodness. And I'm not asking this morning if you're a member of a church. I'm not asking you if you've done good deeds or given money to charitable causes. I'm asking you this one simple question this is the key to everything. Have you yielded your life to the spirit of loving goodness? 
Have you yielded your life to the Spirit of God? This is the very essence of who God is. You bow your head with me this morning all over this building. Every head bowed, every eyes closed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come to you just now in the closing moments of this service. Lord, I just preached a simple little message. But I believe that you have a word for somebody to hear today. And I believe that you're saying to somebody this morning, let me make you good. Let me change your innermost being. Let me begin to work my, my sanctifying work inside of you. Let me, let me work a work of grace that, in your heart that will change your life, that will bring love instead of fear and grace and forgiveness instead of hatred and judgmentalism. God, I believe that this is your word for somebody here today. But I also know, God, that, that you're going to have to, you're gonna have to speak to, to somebody. You have to talk to us deep in our hearts. And with your head bowed and eyes closed, we, how many of you here would just say, Pastor Dave, would you pray for me? I want the Spirit of God to fill my life. I'm tired of the spirit of the world. I'm tired of the spirit of anger. I'm tired of the evil of this world. I want the spirit of the goodness of God, the, the real goodness of God to fill and transform my innermost being. I want Him to make me good on the inside so that goodness will flow out on the, to the outside. You say, I can't make myself good. God needs to do it in me. God needs to do a work of grace, and I want that this morning. I hunger and thirst for righteousness. Or maybe you're not there and you say, but I, I want to hunger and thirst for righteousness. I want to be there. If that's you this morning and you'd like prayer, would you just slip your hand up? We're just going to take a moment. Yes, all over the place. Their hands all over the place. I want to pray for you. Heavenly Father, as we come into your presence, you saw every heart, God. And, and, and this message was not meant to condemn, oh God. I pray, God, that this message would be a, a source of encouragement, that we'd say, wait, there's something more, there's something better. And God, that in the name of Jesus, that by the power of your spirit, you would, you would just help us. Lord, lead us to that place of surrender. And Lord, if there are those who have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just put that longing in their heart, that you would lead them to that place. And God, that regardless of where we are, Lord, that we would just yield more and more to your spirit because we know your spirit is the spirit of goodness. And Lord, we don't want to just do good things. We want the goodness of God to shine brightly in our lives. Lord, help us, help us to do that. Lord, sometimes we just so easily get impatient. We so easily... Uh, make things about ourselves. We so easily neglect people around us, but God help us to see the people around us through the eyes of the goodness of God. Begin that change. Transform us, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.